two incredible stories of murder for you this evening, my dear friends. And it's always a real delight for me when there's a strong female protagonist in a story. And that's the case in the two stories I have for you this evening, both guaranteed to flip whatever you think might happen on its head. You will not guess where these stories are going, I can guarantee you. And it's my great delight to introduce to you Madame Raven. She'll be taking the lead role in the second story this evening, and I want you to go to her channel afterwards, give her some support, subscribe, like, leave some comments, you know the drill. Well, my dear friends, without further ado, it's time once again for you to sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and listen. I sprinted through the woods like a madman, hoping against hope I wouldn't smack face first into a tree limb in the deepening twilight, or step in a hole and break a leg as I pursued my quarry into the forest, praying I wouldn't be too late. I burst into a clearing and found myself standing in the shadow of an old, gnarled oak tree, with two figures before me. One was a boy of about seven years, sprawled unmoving on the damp loam of the forest floor. The other was the stranger who'd abducted him. I'd found them. I can find anyone. No matter where they are, alive and whole, or dead and buried, I can find them. All I need is time, well, and a place to start. Simple, but not easy. Oh, but people think it's easy. They think someone like me just needs to touch their lost child's favourite toy, and I'll get a vision of the little tyke's location. Or else they think it must be like a dowsing rod, only pulling me in the direction of the kid in the well instead of towards the well itself. <laughs> That'd be nice. In reality, it's both more complex and more mundane than some kind of remote viewing or missing person radar. At the most basic level, it's just cause and effect. Every time you go somewhere, each time you interact with your environment in some way, you change things slightly. A footprint left in the dirt, a pebble kicked aside as you walk, a blade of grass trampled down by your passing, or any one of a million other little impacts you have on the world just by moving around in it. To someone like me, it's like everything you step on, everything you touch, hell, everything you breathe on has a little string tied to it with a knot that's as unique to you as your fingerprint. But it gets more complicated from there. Remember the footprint you left in the dirt? It doesn't mean much to you, but to a passing ant, it's a pretty big roadblock. And so, that ant takes a long way around your little Nike-branded impression in the soil, and as a result wanders into a picnic. The ant then tips off the rest of the ants in the colony, and together they end up ruining a family's afternoon by swarming all over Grandma's special apple pie. Dad was really looking forward to that pie, so he's in a bad mood driving home and honks at the guy driving slow in front of him. The guy Dad honks at reflexively slams on the brakes and in turn gets rear-ended by Dad. And now, <laughs> traffic is backed up for miles and every car, driver, pedestrian and picnic ant in a two-mile radius has one of your little strings tied to it. Which is, well, not to say it's all your fault for leaving a footprint, but you can see how these strings of cause and effect can start to look like a giant spiderweb in a hurry. Untangling these strings and tracing them to the person they belong to can therefore be a chore. It also means that what I do would make for terrible television. No one wants to watch a psychic make four loops around the local Walmart tracing invisible strings through the air until he finds the one that leads him where he's going to. Still, from time to time, people find out about me and what I can do, and sometimes they're desperate enough to believe that I can help. And sometimes, they're right. Unfortunately, almost as often, I either can't find the string I'm looking for because the missing person is found by other means, or by the time I follow the string to its end, it leads me to a shallow grave. On the day that preceded my confrontation in the woods, I had been approached by the family of a missing boy asking for my help. They'd heard about one of my successes, 
and they were at the end of their rope. It had been a week, longer than I like to take a case. Usually, by this time, the strings of a person's life have become so entangled with a million others that tracing them from their last known location to where they currently are takes too long to be of much practical use. But they were sad and desperate, and I'm a sucker for that. I told them I'd do what I could, and that there were no guarantees. As per usual, I asked for a picture of the kid and a personal item that I didn't need. <laughs> it was what they expected, so it was easier to just go along with it than try to explain. What I did need was a brief introduction to the rest of the family. Mum, Dad, a sister and two brothers. I quickly learned the pattern of the strings they trail behind them through the world, so I could identify the kid by process of elimination. Then, with a little fanfare, I quietly got to work. From where he'd last been playing in the backyard, I could see a pretty distinct pattern. It was one I'd seen too many times before. Another string, darker and thicker than his, intersected his sharply from outside the home and entangled it. That string was someone older, someone who'd done bad things and was likely to do more in the future. That was the kind of person who'd abducted him. With little hope, I began to follow the trail in earnest, hopping into my car to trace it as it continued down the road. Predictably, the strings leading away from the abduction began to branch out in dozens of different directions, and I had to rely on recognizing the patterns most likely to lead me back onto the main branch, a skill I've cultivated over the years. Ironically, the very things that would help a normal investigation could hinder mine. Someone seeing the abductor and the kid together and noticing something odd, for example, that would tie the string to more people and places most of which would be dead ends that trailed off into nothingness, the strings becoming thinner and thinner until the connections they made with the world could no longer be seen, even by me. I don't think the strings ever really end per se, though. Hell, maybe that's what the soul really is. Not something eternal inside us, but something eternal that grows out from us, sending out millions of branches in millions of different directions on into infinity. <laughs> I try not to think about it too much. Philosophy gives me a headache. I followed the strings around town for hours, becoming more and more discouraged. For all that I suspected he'd done this before, the abductor hadn't gone straight to some planned location. He'd been bouncing all over the place for some reason. Several times I crossed back across my own string, one trail was behind me, just like everyone else, and I'd realized with a sinking feeling that the trail was leading me in circles. Then something clicked in my head, and I froze, almost causing an accident myself as I slammed on the brakes. Drivers behind me honked and swore, but I ignored them as I hurriedly pulled off to the side of the road and then staggered out of my car onto the sidewalk as I took in the interplay of strings I'd stumbled upon. From this street corner, I could see the path through time and space that I'd left behind me, crossing over the abductors and the kid string several times. The realization hit me like a ton of bricks. In multiple places, the abductor's path started to intersect with where I'd been and where I was going, and then suddenly, inexplicably, veered away sharply. Somehow, my string and his were interacting. But there was no way he'd actually been there with the kid in tow at the exact same time I had. I would have seen something. It could only mean one thing. He'd seen my string, and he was trying to avoid it. A chill ran down my spine. There was someone else like me. Someone who'd found a very different use for the gift we shared. I leapt back into the car, shaken but determined as I fumbled the keys back into the ignition, in spite of my shaking hands. I got back on his trail, following it through the day as it continued crisscrossing the area, 
until I finally got lucky and stumbled upon the right segment, one that strongly led in a single direction, into the woods. My string entangled the kidnappers and the kids as I ran headlong into the woods, fumbling in my pocket for the compact pistol I kept there. That convergence was a sure sign I was close. When I burst out of the trees, I found myself staring into the face of the abductor. A tall, thin woman stood there above the boy's prone form, her arms clasped casually behind her back. She was about my age, with long auburn hair and large dark eyes. She smiled, a sad half-smile, as I skidded to a stop in surprise just a few feet from her, my fingers closing around the grip of my gun. Hi, she said. Hi, I replied numbly. This was not what I'd expected, by any stretch of the imagination. I glanced down at the kid, and relief washed over me as I saw his back rise and fall. He was unconscious. He looked dirty and a little worse for wear, but generally unharmed. But that didn't change the dark tones of the string that led to the woman across from me, signaling her intent as strongly as a knife in her hands. So, you can see them too, she said. Them, I asked. The paths, the ones people leave behind, she clarified. I... I call them strings, I muttered, still disarmed by her calm demeanor. She frowned thoughtfully, and then slowly nodded. I can see that. The way they wrap around things, it's kind of reminiscent of knotted strings, isn't it? I recovered myself enough to pull my pistol from my coat pocket, and I leveled the gun at her, dropping into a shooter's stance. Step away from the boy. I ordered. She sighed. Aren't you even going to ask? Ask what? I growled, getting tired of her cryptic bullshit. Why? I took him. She prompted, spreading her arms and gesturing to herself. I mean, I don't exactly fit the profile of a child molester, now do I? Female abductors usually have different reasons, I allowed cautiously, and then I took a step closer, my face growing hard. I said, step away from the boy. She took a long step back, puffing out her cheeks in annoyance as she raised her hands and clasped them securely atop her head. Okay, there. Can we talk now? There's not a lot to talk about, I rejoined, glancing again at the sleeping child. The kid's going home, you're going to jail, or maybe a psych ward, from what I've seen so far. The fact that you're like me doesn't change that. I know that's not true, she dismissed, shaking her head. I've seen it's not true. That's not how this is going to go down. <laughs> what makes you say that? I retorted. Because if I read the way you move around the pathways, or strings if you will, then my guess is you can read the patterns to see where they've been, she mused. That's how you track me, right? So? I, on the other hand, she continued, can't do that. My talent runs the other way. I can see where they're going. <laughs> That's impossible, I scoffed. Is it? she asked, raising an eyebrow. More than what you do? Come on, someone walks down the street, eyes front, hands in their pockets, and they still split off a hundred different pathways that each split into a hundred more. And somehow, in all that chaos, you can read a pattern that tells you where they are. Is it so hard to believe that I can see one that tells me where they're going? I was dumbstruck for a moment. It seemed plausible, but what did it matter? I don't see how that changes what has to happen here, I said. No, you wouldn't, because you haven't seen what I've seen, she replied softly, looking down at the child on the ground. 
You haven't seen where his path goes. The things that he does when he's a grown man. To children just like he is now. My blood ran cold. You... You can't know that. There's no way you could see that far. Are you sure? She counted. Despite starting out a week late, you knew what my intentions were in taking him, I'll wager. How can you be sure that's as far as intention can be read? How do you know I can't see what I know I've seen? The seed of evil, identified before it germinates. She spread her arms again and took a step towards me, her voice imploring. For that matter, how did I know you'd be here now so I could be waiting? Why would I keep the boy alive this long when I could have killed him and been long gone already? I did it so we could have this chance to talk without you being blinded by your emotions. Me? Blinded? I spat angrily. You're the one talking about killing a seven-year-old boy, lady. A monster in waiting. She shot back evenly. <sighs> Even if he is, right now he's just a child, I argued. Even <laughs> even if there's something wrong with him deep down, there's got to be another way. Treatment, therapy, or, <laughs> or something. She shook her head and let out a long sigh. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it would only be sacrificing a clear chance to end the evil he represents in the name of a vain hope. The paths leading into the future, they can change, but not fast enough to be sure in the present. If you could see what he's going to do in the future, you'd understand why I can't take that chance. It's not yours to take, I snarled angrily. It's true we have more information to go on than most, but God, we are not God. We don't have the right to cut strings short because of what they might be tied to in the future. Not a right, a responsibility, she corrected coldly. I hoped you'd be able to understand that. What I understand is that you need to be behind bars, I hissed, frustrated and confused. No, right now I need to leave here, and you, you need time to think, she replied, taking a step back. Don't move. I warned her, taking aim with the pistol. At this distance, I wouldn't miss. I'll see you again soon, she said, with another sad little smile. And then she turned and ran. I squeezed the trigger. I missed. I brought the kid home that same night. I told the father in no uncertain terms that his son had been returned unharmed by persons unknown. He got the message, and I knew, and I knew that was a story he'd tell. I didn't want his thanks, or anyone else's. I just wanted to rest, and to think. I still spared enough time to tell the kid's family that I thought there was a good chance he'd been traumatized by the whole ordeal, and they'd be well advised to get him some professional help, and have him evaluated by a child psychologist. For everyone's sake, I hope they take my advice. I haven't seen the woman from the woods again, but every now and then I see a trace of the long dark string she leaves behind her, and I know it'll only be a matter of time. Twenty-one years ago, when I was four years old, a man waited for my father to leave for his night job, broke in, and murdered my mother. Not the most cheery opening to a story I know, but it is the beginning, and I've always believed in getting right to the point. When the subject is a murdered parent, and when you've lived twenty-one years with it hanging over you, you tend to lose the energy to ease people into it. And let me tell you, when people hear about it for the first time, their reaction is, well, 
boring, if we're being honest. No one says anything new. It's always, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Or, that's terrible. Do you remember her at all? And sometimes, when they're feeling truly bold, they ask if I specifically remember that night. I bet you're wondering that too. So I'll give you the short version. It was a Saturday in late September. The leaves had all started turning colors, and people on my street were in the process of getting ready for Halloween. It wasn't one of those small, sleepy towns, but it wasn't really a big city either, so we knew the neighbors pretty well. We had been invited to a cookout at the Mason's house, and I spent the day playing with their son, Brandon. By the time we got home that night, my dad had to rush to get ready for work and almost ran out without giving us hugs and kisses. I didn't really mind because I was exhausted and cranky. My mother gave me a bath and we watched a movie until I fell asleep on the sofa. She must have brought me upstairs at some point after I'd fallen asleep because the next thing I remember was bolting upright in bed because of a loud crash that sounded like it had happened outside my room. I heard my mother crying and telling someone, Please don't! And I have a child! For what felt like an eternity. Sometimes sounding muffled, sometimes clear as day, sometimes long stretches of time would go by where I wouldn't hear anything. And just as I was about to get out of bed to investigate, she would sob loudly, and I knew it wasn't over. The police report would later say that she had been tied up and assaulted for five and a half hours. From what they could tell, the man would strangle her to the point of passing out, then did other things to her until she regained consciousness. When he was done with her, he strangled her one last time, so hard he completely crushed her windpipe. I never saw him, never heard him speak. For the longest time, I could only picture him as a shadow. I've been to therapy a few times, and I've tried to stay on the straight and narrow for my dad's sake. I guess he did the same for me, and we did all right, all things considered. They caught the guy a few months later, but not before he had killed four more women, the same way he killed my mother. They were all in their late twenties or early thirties. All had brown hair. All of them shopped at the same store and had been signed up for the same rewards program by the same cashier. I'm sure you see where this is going. And I bet you can guess why I always decline offers to save 20% on your purchases by signing up today. Now you know what happened 21 years ago. I can tell you about last week. Last week, for the first time, I sat face to face with Jacob Shorn. Face to face with the man who murdered my mother. He was altogether unremarkable. As far as his appearance, he was in his fifties now, balding with dull brown eyes and a nose that had obviously been broken a few times. Other than that, there wasn't anything that stood out. He spoke softly and didn't seem all that phased by speaking with me, even after I introduced myself as Ellen Walker's daughter. Hmm, yes, I remember Ellen. He said calmly. You look just like her. Yeah, I get that a lot, I responded. I stared at him, biting the inside of my cheek as thoughts raced through my head. I'd imagined this meeting a million times, and now that I was actually sitting in front of him, I felt completely blank. After a few moments, he inhaled deeply and the corners of his mouth twitched in an anxious grin. I assume you have questions, he asked finally. His tone was easy, pleasant even, 
as if he was a museum curator that found me staring at a particular piece of art for a long time. I find everyone seems to want to know why. To be honest, though, that gets boring after a while. I wish I could give you a reason, I said. Wish I could tell you that my dad used to get drunk and beat me, or that my priest molested me or something. But the truth is, I just liked killing. Isn't that what you told them in that interview a few years ago? He looked impressed. After a few moments, he spoke again. Hmm. You're an interesting little thing, aren't you? He rubbed his bearded chin thoughtfully. Could I actually form the words I've been dying to ask him? Ask the questions that have been swirling in my brain since I was seven years old? I took a deep breath. I saw her. I began. After you left, I got out of bed and went to see if she was okay. I saw her body on the floor in the living room. I've never told a single soul. Not my dad. Not the cops. Not my therapist. Then, why are you telling me? He asked curiously. I glanced over my shoulder at the guard standing by the door, then back to Jacob. The words felt like acid burning the back of my throat, begging to get out. My heart pounded loudly in my ears as I leaned in. When I was seven, I wanted to understand how I felt that night. So I started where we all start. He looked perplexed for a moment, but I saw the exact moment his eyes lit up with dawning realization. Then he grinned knowingly, like a proud father. Strays? Yes. <laughs> well, I'll be. He chuckled, rubbed his beard again. I can't give away the rest of the conversation. I'm sure you'll piece it together yourself if you pay close enough attention to the news. I'm sure it's going to take ages for the detectives and profilers to work out. <laughs> Female serial killers are pretty rare after all. Well, I don't know about you, but I really, really enjoyed those two incredibly imaginative stories. Um, didn't see the endings coming, did you? Well, I didn't when I was reading them. Thanks once again to the wonderful Madame Raven for her help with the second story. Hope you enjoyed that, and um, please go to her channel, show her some love. Does some really great stuff, I've collaborated with her before, and a uh, real pleasure to host her on my channel. Well, it's the weekend. I'll be back again on Monday with some more wonderful treats for you. So, I'll see you again then. But for now, sweet dreams and bye-bye. <laughs>